Well, good morning, everybody. As we know, winter is still here, and that will affect all of us just a little bit, but it's always good to have you here. And we want it to be a time that you are encouraged and refreshed. And to do that, of course, we need to dedicate our hour, don't we? So let's do that. Father, we look around and we, th we see that uh, there are so many people in the world who are in great need. And Lord, we have our own needs, but we can see that we are incredibly blessed. Even though we complain about so many things, Lord, we come here with the purpose of considering what we have, not only in this world, but more importantly, in the world to come, because we know that we are here to worship a risen Savior. So, Father, I'm asking that you'd make this a, an important, valuable hour for each one of us, for our kids in particular, Lord. We always pray that they would learn early the importance of serving you. And, Father, these things we're asking for as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. That was a nice, hearty good morning. If you would stand this morning as we worship our God and King. here today to worship you for for that for you are God for you are the I am and Lord we thank you to know that um, that we know that every day that that doesn't change that you will never go away that you will never leave us and Lord we um, we find comfort and we put our faith in your unfailing love 
your never-ending love. And we, um, Lord, today I just pray that you would keep everybody safe as they continue to come. We thank you for the safety you've given us and this warm place to be. Just thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, 
Really, we're getting used to this weather, sort of. But we do caution you, like Daniel had prayed, that you're extra careful when you go outside. We've done everything we can to sprinkle uh, and abrasive everywhere and the salt. But there is some place that's been missed, so just be extra careful. And um, so thankful to see all of you here today. Let's go through our announcements, and then we do have some updates on our prayer list. You see, it's, uh, it's a good sign, right, that Easter is coming. That means spring is coming. And you see, we have an Easter choir. We'd like to have one. We had that last year, and it was just really special. A number of people could commit to a shorter period of time for the choir practices. So you see there the information. Um, it'll be participating in the choir for April 1st. And we're asking that you sign up or indicate to Linda Wade that you'll be able to do that. Practices will be February and March each Sunday evening. And then also, as we always do every year, we need to ask you to look ahead in your calendar and find times where you could commit to our children's program. Not only do we want to give them good care, but we want them to be encouraged and excited every week about learning God's Word. So those sign-up sheets are on the back. And then the Grand Prix, we have rearranged some of our major events to keep them from all piling up onto, uh, into one month. But we did need to bump back the Grand Prix. We canceled last week due to the fog. As is always the case, it seems like, as soon as you cancel, the, the fog starts to blow away. But it was really quite uh, dangerous during the earlier part of that evening. So that is on February the 7th. So those cars will be going out this next week, Lord willing. We do need to bring you up to date on uh, some prayer lists, and then I'm going to ask Daniel to give you an announcement about a, an upcoming opportunity for a study. Uh, we need to add, uh, and I'm not sure how we missed them on our list here. That was my fault. I just didn't see it ahead of time. Uh, the Bryants. Mr. and Mrs. Bryant, they're home and doing better, but he really had quite a, well, there's Barb. He really had quite a time with the flu and everything. Are they still making progress? Still making progress, but that's still coughing. That's a matter of how it's in a couple of weeks. Other than the mm -hmm. So, he's just walking with some strange issues. Yeah. I spoke with your mom a couple of days ago, and... They sounded encouraged just to be home, so I'm glad for that. Jean St. Clair is really, she has no pain whatsoever from that fall. You can see, you know, how the marking will happen with the bruising, but she says she's feeling just fine, so we're thankful for that. Sue Lau had her surgery. That went very well. She should be home. She was on her way home yesterday when we spoke with Ron. Um, she'll need, you know, all the extras that come with a, a knee replacement, the home therapy, uh, extra people to help her get things done. If you could put a star by Sam and Laura Minthorn's names. Now, they have a great grandson, Leo. The baby was born uh, premature, has a heart monitor, has a number of health issues. So they are taking 12 hour shifts. One stays up all day because they have to watch the baby 24 hours a day. And then that person goes to bed and then the next one stays up all night. So pray for the little baby, of course, and pray for the extra strength that Sam and Laura uh, need. Uh, it's a big, big responsibility. And then skip down to Ronita Alcorn's grandson, Ray. We keep mentioning him because... Uh, his situation, quite honestly, continues to worsen all of the time. And uh, they have told the family just uh, to get ready because the most difficult days are, are to come. So if you'd remember to pray for that young boy. And then uh, Barb Miller is hopefully within the next week or week and a half will be able to come home. And then in a couple of weeks after that, be ready to go back for another knee replacement. She did have some issues with the strong antibiotics. You know, those, uh, they're a blessing, but they also create complications on, a, on occasion. So pray that it, uh, that part of the process really goes well for her. 
And then uh, Barb Richter, we can take her off our list. She has rebounded very well. You see our shut-ins down on that list. Not only do these people need our prayers, but if you would think, well, I don't even hardly know them, but if you would give them a call, write them a card during these days when they are not able to get out, that really means a lot. And then if you look around and we'll ask the sister, we haven't seen Larry for a couple of weeks. Is he still down in the physically? All right. All right. So let's pray for Larry and for Donna. All right. Yes. Isn't that great? Amen. Isn't that great? He's one of our young men in the youth group. That is really great. Uh, if there's something that's going to make you seek the Lord for help, it's called boot camp. <laughs> oh, Lord, help me. All right. Uh, I did have a, a message from Donna Oberg. She had completed her treatments on the 27th of December. Well, we're thankful for that. She is home and in her bed and sick with all the things that are going on. I'm not sure, you know, what else might be influencing that, but I told her we would pray for her, and that's Donna Oberg. All right. Carla, hey, honey. Oh, that's who I wanted to write down. Thank you. Uh, Carla Ellis. She was here just last week. They were sitting up there, and the poor lady has had so much trouble with her her asthma and her lungs. She is back in the hospital with double pneumonia. Went in last night. Uh, they think they've caught it early enough that with a couple of days of treatment, she'll be able to go back home. But this weather and this time of the year just plays havoc with her health. And there are always serious issues. So remember to pray for Carla. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to pray, and then Daniel's going to say a few words. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and, and to bring uh, into the conversation these individuals and their particular situations. Lord, as we've mentioned them, we've done it with, a, with an attitude of prayer. Lord, we've mentioned them because they are in need of the kind of intervention that you give, that you promise to give. Lord, we know that uh, there are many uh, dealing with the flus and colds and viruses of all sorts. And Lord, we're just asking that you would uh, keep these on our list in particular, our shut-ins. Keep them uh, uh, safe from these things. Lord, we know that their health is a bit fragile anyway. So Lord, we're asking that you would bless those that we've mentioned. Lord, each one on our list as we continue to faithfully pray for them each week. Lord, we ask that we'll see the good work that you've promised to do. And again, Father, we can ask for this with confidence because we know that the Lord Jesus made it possible that we can step into your presence at any time with these needs. And again, praying in Jesus' name, we ask that you do this. Amen. All right. Now, Daniel's got a, uh, an announcement to give. Make sure and explain that we will still be happening here. All right. All right, so you had a, in your bulletin this morning, there was a, a half-page flyer in there. Um, we're going to be doing a 10-week, at this point it's going to be a 10-week, it's um, a study in the, during the 9-15 hour in the basement as a Sunday school. Um, there's a sample back, like the first weekend, and then um, one of the days is back in the black binder on the back table there. Um, but the study is called Walking as Jesus Walked, and what it is, there's a a uh, workbook that goes with it. So if you would, if you'd, if you'd be interested in doing this, um, put your name and an email on the bottom there and uh, get it to me, drop it in the plate or something, get it back to me so that we can make sure that you have a book. But it's a, a weekly study um, that is five days during the week, has a short lesson, and then on Sunday morning, there's a bigger lesson with a sh or short video they've put together. Um, I've got an introduction video here that um, I'm going to have Aaron play, kind of give you an idea of what, it's, what it is. So we're going to order those books. Um, the videos, if you don't know, um, Julie was actually asking me this morning, um, she's got Sunday school for the kids upstairs, and um, I said, go ahead and, and do it, because all of these resources that we're going to use are available 
online to everybody. Um, you know, we'll have the discussion downstairs, and there's a, a weekly thing to go through down there. But it, you will get a lot out of um, doing the weekly the weekly lessons and, and understanding. Um, just as he talked there, walking as Jesus walked. So um, that'll be ten weeks. There'll be we're gonna have coffee. Um, as the paper says there, we'll have an occasional breakfast delight, aka a donut. Um, but uh, um, please consider that. Also, during that sir, during that time. Um, we, there still will be, um, up here, um, Bruce has got something he's working on for, um, that, those 10 weeks, um, up here as well, to, since I'll be downstairs to cover the music and he's got something a little different planned there, but we'll continue to do what we do up here as well. Um, so, um, consider that and, um, see which, if you'd like to, to do that and let me know. Thanks. After that commercial, if you'd stand with us. Back to worshiping our Savior, and, and he is the great I am. He is, um, as we've already sang, he, um, he is in control of all. And so what he's asked us to do, what he's called us to do, um, is live a life um, for him and to um, um, do what he's called us to do. seated the kids may go to Sunday school now with this opportunity in the basement that will start at 9 15 yes and the kids will be up here in fact it should be quite entertaining because Andy Curtis said, I don't mind sitting with the kids. So we're going to have all the kids up here with Andy. Are you going to help, Deb? You don't know anything about it, but you would help your husband because you're faithful and loving and kind. Oh, yeah. But anyway, we're going to involve the kids with some of our singing. Uh, we have a nice little children's choir up here to help us with that music. So we'll be all covered there. Now, if you'll take a look at your notes, I believe they're coming out now. And they're entitled, They Were First Called Christians. We're moving along in the chronology of the New Testament church. Ultimately, that is our goal, is to walk through not only the book of Acts, but to bring in the, the various epistles 
that are written and, and many of them have historical footnotes in them and be able to place them in the right place. If you remember last week, we talked about a great controversy that was happening in the church and indeed the lesson today continues with that. It's not like, well, they had a meeting and once they had the meeting, everything was figured out. This was the, the great uniting of the church it has been a Jewish church. Now that's understandable because Jesus brought the gospel to the Jews first. That's what was promised, that that would be brought to the Jews. And as you know, through a, a really uh, complicated set of circumstances, it wasn't long until the Jewish nation, the leaders in particular said, we don't want anything to do with him. In fact, they started shouting out, crucify him, crucify him. And the entire land was in a turmoil because this was the best known individual apart from Herod in the entire place. And Pontius Pilate and those political leaders. I mean, everybody knew about Jesus. Everybody knew what he had done, or at least they had heard about things that others said he had done. Perhaps, no doubt, many in the land said, I know it's true because it was my cousin or it was my cousin's first wife's second cousin three times removed. But you know, it was family. People in the families knew. And the stories, no doubt, kept growing because there's no reason to think the people were any different then than we are. I mean, you know, it kept growing and growing and changing. So not everybody knew exactly the story of Jesus, but everybody knew who he was because of all of this happening. And when he was ascended and he commissioned his disciples to establish this new work of God called the church, it was by its very nature Jewish because it was in Jerusalem. But Jesus had clearly spoken of it long before in his ministry, but especially at his ascension. He says, listen, this message, it's not a Jewish message. This is a good news message for the entire world. And what you're going to do is you're going to start here like the, like the pebble dropped into a quiet pool of water. And it's just going to start spreading out, spreading out. That is what's happening. And now for these 4,000 years, the Jews have been separated from the rest of the world. Everything they've done has been in this, in this understanding that there's a Jewish world that I'm a part of, and there's a Gentile world that I am shunning. And now all of a sudden, the gospel message is going to both the Jews and the Gentiles. And now what do you do? You have spent your entire life not liking a particular group of people, not understanding their language, their culture, their way. And now you find yourself going to church with them on a weekly basis, not just a service like we have, but there they lived together. They suffered together. Can you imagine that if in our little bitty community here that we had some industry that started and we were all excited about that and all of a sudden there were Muslims from all around the world that came into this little community. People who looked different than us, talked differently, acted differently, thought differently, responded and reacted differently than us. And all of a sudden, a great revival breaks out in that large community. And we wake up on a Sunday morning, and the church is full, and about half are Hoosiers. And who's ever understood a Hoosier? Not sure we do. And now the other half was Muslim, and they were brought together. Can you imagine, one, how exciting it would be? Two, how confusing it would be? How many misunderstandings there would be because we just didn't really understand one another. Well, that's happening now in the church. So where we are today is in Antioch in Syria. It's quite some distance from Jerusalem. 
And we pick up the story, and with that background, we'll begin to see what's happening now in this great movement of God called the church. They were first called Christians. Barnabas and the converts at Antioch, the Christian assembly at Antioch. It says, meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. They preached the word of God. Now let's stop there for a second because it doesn't say that the apostles preached the word of God. It doesn't say that the, the clergy preached the word of God. This was a, hey, my life was radically changed and I'm telling everybody else what Jesus did to me. This is these believers are now going out and they are proclaiming the gospel message. Now understand they do not have the New Testament as we understand it. That has yet to be, to be given to the church. All they have is an understanding of the Old Testament with all of its promises that a Messiah is coming and they are absolutely, absolutely certain because of a personal encounter with him and they know that Jesus is the Son of God, the Messiah. He is the Savior. They don't know as much as you know concerning the great plan of God. All they know is who Jesus is and what he did and why he did it and how they responded and now their life has been completely changed. Now one reason why this gospel message is going everywhere with people who were not well educated in theology, it's because of God's great plan to give his Holy Spirit. If you remember, everywhere we've been, that's been a big deal. On the day of Pentecost, the evidence of God's Holy Spirit was, was there with those people as they responded to the gospel. When they went to Samaria, all of a sudden, these people, too, were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And then, then we went to the, the Gentiles, and here these Gentiles, these believers who knew nothing of Judaism perhaps, but now they have heard the gospel message and because of that, they too have been filled with the Holy Spirit. So when we look at the book of Acts, it's not a great educational plan. It's not a strategy to, to advertise and to, and to take a message and present it to the world in a way that you know, is pleasing and appealing. It's not that at all. This is the Spirit of God working through his people, accomplishing great things. We too have the Spirit of God. We too have a mission field. We too have the same gospel message. I mean, it's obvious that if in the worst set of circumstances, the gospel can spread and prosper and change lives, it can continue to do the same here in Fulton or anywhere else. So let's start off again. They preach the word of God, but only to Jews. That's that division we mentioned. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believe and turn to the Lord. Where the gospel is preached, the work of God continues. And here these people are. They probably did not know that Jerusalem would have been more comfortable if they did not preach and speak and interact with the Gentiles. These people were so overwhelmed by what Christ had done in them and for them, they couldn't help but tell everybody around them. I sometimes think, and maybe the world is pressuring us to, to present a gospel that is not really clearly understood because there are some who would say, you know what, I, I would like to preach the gospel. I would like to tell the story of what Jesus has done for me, but you don't understand, my life is still a wreck. 
you don't understand. I am still, I mean, I got troubles. I got more troubles than I can count. Everything is going wrong in my life. How can I preach the gospel if I'm such a sorry example? Well, we need to understand that that is not the way the gospel works. It doesn't say, now now go out and preach the good news when your life is all put back together and everything is working just right from one day to the next. That's not how we live in this broken down world. I mean, we're dealing with our own flesh we're dealing with the circumstances of this world. We're dealing with an enemy that works against us, the world, the flesh, and the devil. All of us are dealing with all of those negatives. In spite of how upside down our lives are, what makes the difference from week to week is not that I'm living up here on the top in great victory. Oh, I just sailed through the week, everything in my life is just fine. That's not what's important. What's important is with every up and down and right and left turn of my life, I have had the assurance that I am not alone. Think about it. We live during the probably the very best time in all of history. We live, without, a, without any doubt, we live in what is the best circumstance that the world has ever seen. I mean, as a people, we get up every day with very few fears. We have resources. We have, we have to sit around and, and think of what we're going to do with all of our spare time. Do you realize that in generations past, they didn't have to worry about what they were going to do with their spare time. They were fighting every single minute just to survive. So now we are living in what is the best place, perhaps in the best time of all of history. And even with that, our lives are chaotic, aren't they? If you begin to read through history, you find out that there are gen I mean, thousands of generations now of people who have had nothing but heartache and misery from the day they were born until the day they die. And what has made the difference with so many of those people is to know that they are not alone, that Jesus Christ the Son of God, the Savior of the world, walks with them through every hard time. So don't think that you need to wait and share the gospel after your life settles down. People are watching. They know what you're going through. If not, perhaps you should tell them what you're going through. And in so doing, you give an opportunity to say, in spite of all these heartaches, there's an assurance that I have that Jesus, the Son of God, walks with me. That's what the world needs to hear. Not that when we found Jesus, we found all the answers in life. But it's that we found someone who will never leave us and never forsake us. So these people are spreading this good news story. Jesus is with me. He has changed my life. He has given me assurance that there is something better, a new heaven and a new earth. So let's pick up our story. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believe and turn to the Lord. Now the Christian associates at Antioch. First one is Barnabas. When the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. <clears throat> it is a privilege. It's not always a pleasant privilege, but it is a privilege to, to be a part of funerals. And I understand that I say the same thing at every funeral because I want people to know and understand the gospel. That's the most important thing we do at a funeral is we give people an opportunity to hear the gospel without all of its trappings. Just to hear this is the main message God has for you. 
But something that is very important as well is to take an opportunity and seek to summarize somebody's life. To recognize with the family the importance of that individual. To highlight some of the good things that they've accomplished. How would you like to have people say this about you? I mean, Barnabas is a pretty good guy. He was positive. Man, that's a good thing. You know, when you're gone, when you love for your, your, your family, your children, your grandchildren, your co-workers, your neighbors to say, oh, he was such a positive guy. He was always looking for something good. He was an encourager. Boy, if you ever felt down, he'd come along and pat you on the back or she'd give you a hug and, and just encourage you to get up and go. I mean, what a great testimony there that he was, like Barnabas, a good man. She was a good woman, meaning that there was just something about them that was easily recognized, that everybody could sense there was a goodness in this individual, full of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that she or he was weird, although that could be too. I mean, you know, how many of you know a weird Christian? Am I the only one? Trust me. Some of you are on my list, all right? Maybe I'm on your list. But anyway, here are these Christians, and, and being filled with the Spirit doesn't mean that you're fanatical and weird. No, here's how Paul described it. The person who is filled with the Holy Spirit has love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. This is the fruit that is growing in this person's life. Because of the Holy Spirit's influence in their life, they desire holiness and they, they sorrow when they fall into sin. And they get up every day and strive to be better than they were the previous day because they're compelled to do that by the presence of God's Holy Spirit. What a great testimony Barnabas had. And then it said that he had strong faith. That did not mean that nothing bad happened in his life. We'll see later on as we read through this story of the New Testament. It doesn't mean that he doesn't make mistakes along the way. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have disagreements with people in the, in the future. But what it means is this person, no matter what the circumstances are, this person says, you know what? God is with me and I'll go with him tomorrow. I'll walk with him tomorrow. He was a man of strong faith. Another individual that we see come back into our story is Saul. <clears throat> and we've seen Saul. He was in Jerusalem, a part of the persecution. Later on, he begins to lead the persecution. It's not long until we see in the, in the story there in Acts chapter 6 that he's on his way to persecute more. And all of a sudden, now the circumstances are moved by God and he is confronted with the gospel because he meets Jesus on the road to Damascus. It's not long until he is preaching with fervency. He's preaching with new believer enthusiasm. And because of that, people not only hear him and respond, but many of them have decided he's a detriment. We need to kill him. And now he's been off at the desert. He's been taught there. He's been working in his hometown of Tarsus. And here's what we see. Then Barnabas <clears throat> went on to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. In my study, I stopped there and I had to ask myself, what do people call me? It's all right if they call me, oh, he's the pastor of that church. That's all right. I'm honored to be called the father of, and you could list all of my children there. I'm honored to be called the husband of Beth Russell. If I go to New York, that's how I'm known. But we have to ask this question. When all the people who are watching us, all of those who are watching me, 
If they were asked to describe me, if they were asked to describe you, would they say the word Christian? Are they a Christ follower? Are they one of those like Christ? This is the first time this phrase is used, this word, Christian, Christ ones. Is that how we are known to our friends, to our co-workers, even to those people who may not like us? Do they know us as a Christ follower? Here it is. Everybody says, I don't know what church they belong to. I don't know anything about their culture. I don't know anything about where they come from. All I know is it's obvious to me that those people are the people who follow Jesus. Because that's the most important thing to them. So there is Saul now back in our story. And then we have a name, <clears throat> Agabus, the prophet. And as Luke is telling us the story here in Acts chapter 11, starting at verse 27, there's great things happening in Antioch. The news is spreading everywhere. Everybody's excited. And it says, during this time, some prophets traveled from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up in one of the meetings and predicted by the Spirit that a great famine was coming upon the entire Roman world. This was fulfilled during the reign of Claudius, Luke adds later, just to make sure we understand that it really did happen. That was the revelation. Look at the response. So the believers in Antioch decided to send relief to the brothers and sisters in Judea, everyone giving as much as they could. This they did, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul to take uh, to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. Isn't it really interesting that now this Gentile church, and they're having their conflicts, just like Jerusalem is having their conflict, trying to figure out how do we merge two parts of the world who don't even fit together, how do we put them in the same family? How do we put them in the same church and these people who were so different from one another, there's a bond that's beginning to grow and to develop. And now these in Antioch, by word of special revelation, they say, oh no, if there's a famine coming, we're obligated to care for our Christian brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And the people give, not out of, oh, I feel bad for them, it says they gave as much as they could to avert a crisis. As was the case for us, oftentimes it's not a matter of not having any food. There was food in the land, but because of its scarcity, the price was going to go way up. Sort of like certain times of the year you think, whoa, last week gasoline was 50 cents less. I mean, you know, World events happen and all of a sudden the prices go way up. This gentleman, this prophet, told by the Holy Spirit to share this news. As soon as this congregation heard this, they did everything they could to gather up the needed funds, the, the funds they could afford to give away and gave it to Paul and Silas and said, go, or Paul and Barnabas, you go back and take care of our brothers and sisters. This is now we see the first real mission program of the church. This congregation realizing that they live in a bigger world than their own community. That they have an obligation to Christian brothers and sisters everywhere. We have been very blessed in our church. Over the years we have had a faithful giving on your part. We've had men and women who, who look at every dollar because it's not their money, it's not the church's money, it's the Lord's money. And it's been devoted and invested in matters of ministry. We've had even some incredible special gifts that have been given to us. 
And with that, there's an understanding on the part of the leadership. I know there's an understanding on the part of the congregation that when we are given much, we are required to share it, to distribute it, to give it to where it's needed most. That's hard to know what to do sometimes, how to, how to make that determination. But I want you to know that in many ways, we are like this church in Antioch. That even though we are just a little church in a little community in the middle of the country, that we understand that there is a responsibility we have for the whole world. And that's why we have missionaries. I would encourage you to go to our website. And the ones we can publish, we have their updates there, always there. You can go there every day and read a missionary report and, and give time to being a, being a prayer warrior for that individual ministry. Because this is what the church does. The church does whatever it can to spread the gospel around the world. I'd like to thank you for being a part of that, for encouraging others to do their part by leading in ministries. This is the beginning of a great work that we see continue now into the future. It is so exciting for us to see our young people, many of them who could go somewhere else for better opportunities, but they feel committed to come back to our community, to come back to our church, because in part they understand that the work we're doing is so important, that it's a work that affects all of eternity. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads, please? <laughs> A couple of questions are obvious here because of the context, the scriptures that we've read. One is, what is driving you in your life? If you're searching for happiness, for contentment, if you're wanting to have your own way, well, you know what? It's been pretty well documented that that doesn't work. The world is full of people who are desperately trying to have their way in every circumstance and all they do is complicate their lives. The more they want, the less they have. It's like scratching poison ivy. The more you scratch, the more it itches. What is your mission as an individual? What is your commitment to the Lord and to this church? How are you giving? I mean, these are the questions we run into all the time when we read of the early church. But the biggest and most important question is this. What are you doing with your gospel story, your faith story? Are you hesitating to share it because you've got so many issues in your life? Trust me, we've all got issues in our lives. This world wants to hear our story. All they want to know for certain is that you can tell them that their sins can be forgiven. That they can look forward to an eternity of bliss because there is a Savior who promises to redeem they want to know that when they go through this world, they will not go alone. That somebody bigger and better than themselves will go with them. And he is Jesus. Father, I'm asking that you would indeed encourage us, teach us. That your Holy Spirit would motivate us to be a part of what was started now many, many, many years ago that we would be faithful to carry on the work and hand it off to the next generation, that the whole world might know that Jesus is alive, that he is the Savior, that he is the coming King, and that knowing him changes everything. Father, give us the same passion these people in Antioch had. Give us the same desires to do the same kind of work 
And Father, we'll ask for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here. God bless you.